Hey there friends, Karen Pennington here and once again I have been reminded of something in me that shows me that I'm not God. <laughs> a little bit of a flaw I have uh, and that is that uh, I just am not good with names. I feel so bad about it. I I try. I think I'm pretty intelligent. I can honestly I can memorize whole chapters of scripture. It doesn't doesn't bug me. I can just like master all this information and throw it in my brain. But names are so difficult for me. I'm not sure why, because I love people and I adore their stories and I just feel so strongly that everyone matters to God. Maybe it's because I meet too many people and then it's like it floods in and floods out just as quickly. Now, once your mind, once your name is in my brain, I mean, I'll remember it in 20 years, but until that point... <laughs> I'm so bad at it. I don't know if anyone else has this problem. But then I have this pride thing where once I've asked you your name like twice and I forget your name, I will just stop asking and I'll try to use other clues for someone else to get your name. But I'm still too proud to say, I just forgot you. I also don't want to make people feel bad, you know. So maybe the epitome of this is that there is this lovely lady at my church started coming a few years ago uh, and mother of one of my friends and she told me her name and of course I forgot it so the next week I asked she told me her name again and she didn't come for a little bit and I think I'd asked a third time I, I think it was either two or three times I asked and I then I stopped asking because like every time I saw her it was like blank absolutely blank and <laughs> so for like six months I'd be like hey Hey, hey you you know that thing where you get a you make up for your lack of you know memory by just enthusiasm oh it's so good to see you I'd give her a hug I was glad she'd hear I'm glad she's here well six months later I heard her daughter say her name and it was Karen <laughs> that's my name she had my name and I couldn't remember it I'm, I'm that bad <laughs> at names and um uh, it gets even worse because I do so much substitute teaching. Depending on the day or the week, I usually go through, I mean, as many as one or 200, depending on whether I'm working in a middle school or an elementary school, but one or 200 names a week. And sometimes if I'm in the same classroom for a week or a month, of course I'll remember them because I keep seeing it in writing. See, the key seems to be seeing it in writing. And, I, there were, again, children from my church, and I knew the last name, and I had a kid from my church in my class, and I didn't recognize him all day long. It's, now, I had only seen him a couple of times. I had only had taught him, I think, twice, but I had seen his face around. I didn't even recognize his face. I usually recognize faces. And then I was at a different school where same last name, and I thought that kid was from the church, and I'm, oh, are you so-and-so's son? No, I've never heard of him. <laughs> I'm just, I get so confused and jumbled in my head and then it makes me feel so bad because I don't want people to feel like I don't value them or that I'm, I don't notice them or that I'm not glad to see them, but there's just this thing. But sometimes we do, we, it hurts our feelings when people don't remember us or our names even, you know, it hurts our feelings when there's a list that's put up and we're not on it. You know, the, the honors list, that cast list, did I, did I make a good part? The, the awards list. Uh, the invitation list, you know, it, we want to be included, you know. I want people to know us. I, I confess there have been a couple times where, you know, friends have had very small, intimate weddings and I didn't make the list and it kind of hurt my feelings and I had to work through it where I was like, you know, maybe it was just family and friends. And then I've been on the opposite side where I didn't want to make anyone feel left out, but ultimately you have to because you can't feed the whole town we had we spent like I don't know hundreds and hundreds of dollars my my daughter's third birthday because I was afraid that anyone would feel excluded and it was such a pain and it didn't help my daughter and I mean 50 people at the party she was three she didn't care about any of that and then ultimately I couldn't even pay a lot of attention to her because I was playing paying attention to the guests but it's this whole thing about valuing a person's name because it, even more so in Bible times, your name was so wrapped up in your identity. That brings me back to the same scripture that I was 
thinking about yesterday and actually thought about it on Sunday. It's now Wednesday and I don't know, Monday we skipped, but when Jesus sent out in Luke 10, these 72 people and, uh, on Sunday I was thinking of it as an encouragement to friends of mine who are going to be mystery men missionaries. Yesterday it was a challenge. I didn't even know what I was thinking about. I just knew I was supposed to read it. And the idea of just totally surrendering to God without any other resources or qualifications and how that's enough. And today I'm just thinking about these names again in light of this family who has four children whose names I am going to learn. I have them written in my phone. <laughs> I have them written down so I can see their names every day because I had another child from this family in a middle school class yesterday and I said, I'm going to know your names. Uh, but so Jesus sends out the 72 and they do amazing things without any resources, without any qualifications, without a second set of clothing, without even having made friends ahead of time. They go into towns, just find a place to stay and demons are submitting to them. Demons are submitting to them. And it, it says, again, I read this yesterday. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to your name. It's a powerful name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like night lightning from heaven. I have given you an authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all of the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This whole name thing again. <laughs> and the written thing. And there are a few things I noticed even this morning that I hadn't. I, I love how scripture is so rich and so layered. It's like a seven layer cake. And if you don't like cake, I'm sorry. I like cake but it's, it's rich, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time to digest. It's so good. Uh, in, in seminary, I learned the word multivalent, and that means just there are so many layers. So you can go back to this scripture over and over and over again and find new things. I had a period where Psalm 23, I just taught it over and over and over again, and we meditated on it. I taught it in classes where we learned how to meditate and uh, do something called Lectio Divina, which is a form of meditation, just thinking of scripture. And every time I did it, I learned something new from this just short passage of scripture. And um, I've had times in my life where I felt led to go through an entire book of the Bible, like a, a big one even, in a day or two, just read through the Kings within the next week. And those are two really big books, First Kings and Second Kings. And then there are times where I just you just sit with one scripture or one verse. And these verses, two verses really, about the 70 two people being so excited that they had the demons had submitted to Jesus name the name being so powerful that everyone knew it and submitted to it and they weren't necessarily to me they submit to your name because with your name when you imparted your name you imparted your authority that no power of darkness can stand against we you know we all have that those of us who follow the lord and those of us who submit to the lord we have an authority most of us don't even realize that the very powers of darkness must submit not to us but to Christ in us. That in itself, that name thing, holy moly. There's a scripture in Ephesians. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to find it now. Ephesians 1, where there's a prayer. Paul knew this power. And he said, I keep asking, this is Ephesians 1, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength. Even as I say this, my prayer for all of us today is that we may understand. Those of us who don't know the Lord 
that we may know, that we may come and ask and receive, and like the 72, just to understand that Jesus is our qualification and that we just need to lean into him. And yes, we want to try to learn more and lean into Christ and find out more about who we are in Christ and what can we do. And yes, we want to hone our skills and all that, but really Christ, that's the power. And that those of us who know the Lord will know the hope to which he's called us. We'll know how rich we are in Christ. And to know the power. That power is like the working of his mighty strength. See Ephesians 1.19. These people, these 72 who went out, they knew the power of the name of Jesus. They didn't say God... Even the demons submit to us. No, no. Even the demons submit to us in your name. And then Jesus' response was, Don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your name, your names are written in heaven. Demons don't even need to know you. They just need to know me. And fall down because of it. You know what I've, you know, it's ironic about all this. We're talking about the power of a name. We're talking about their names being written in heaven and then rejoicing that their names are written in heaven. We don't know any of their names. These aren't the disciples. These aren't the, the 12 that are mentioned. It said he appointed 72 others. That's chapter 1. I mean, that's verse 1 of Luke 10. He appointed 72 others. So the only thing that we know about them is, um, Number one, they weren't the disciples. They were just some other people. Number two, they had nothing when they went except for Jesus' name and the clothes on their back. That's it. Jesus called Jesus' name and the clothes on the back. Number three, the demons submitted because all they had was Jesus' name, but that was enough. And number four, God knew their name. God knew their name. You know, I had a cheat last week. I was at the Writers' Conference, and uh, they really, there was so much joy and so much openness, and so many people. There was about 400 of us, and most of us didn't know each other, so they encouraged, heavily, heavily encouraged for us to wear name tags all the time so we could just talk to each other and be friendly and not have to do that awkward thing that I always have to do and say, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, or just... Fine. And hey, you, we didn't want to be in the hey, you, you know, we wanted to know the names. And so I'm in one session and we're doing worship and the leader said, just turn around and greet the person next to you. And so I turned around and I forgot <laughs> at this point, I don't know what the man's name was, but I read, I'm like, hey, good to see you. And I said his name and he looked bewildered, like, oh, you remembered me. <laughs> and he was like, you could see a look of amazement sort of and guilt on the same time because he's like, I don't remember your name. And, and I had never met the man before in my life. The name was written on the name tag. <laughs> and like me, the person, worst person in the world with names, I knew his name, but not because it was something I remembered. I never met him. It was because it was written somewhere that I could read it, written somewhere that I could understand it. And so then I my name tag was backwards. So I flipped it around. And I said, actually, you know, <laughs> I came plain. Actually, I just read it. I didn't remember it. And, um, I always need to have people's name written down in paper at first. And once I read it on paper over and over again, like a class list, then it becomes impounded in my brain. And once I know them, it becomes impounded on my brain. And, uh, our, our names are written in God's heart. Our names are written on God's heart. What a wonderful thought. What a comforting thought. God knows us. What a terrifying thought. Sometimes. He 
Hebrews 4.13. Before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. There's nothing hidden from God. So why try? Why pretend? God knows our name. But you know that word know, almost anywhere you see that, there's a few different forms of it. But in talking about how God knows us, there's this word that's used over again called ginosko. And what that means is an intimate awareness. He doesn't know us the way that we would know 2 plus 2 equals 4. He doesn't know us in the way that I understand that I live a few hours from the ocean on the East Coast, not a few, or that I understand that I'm close to Canada. He doesn't know us the way that I know that what the president's name is. He knows us in the way, closest thing, that a man knows a woman, that a woman knows a man when they get married. It's that intimacy. There's such intimacy that we're naked before him. He sees in us what we don't see in ourselves. That thing where we get mad at other people, but it's really our issue, God sees that from the beginning. That, that thing where we don't even know why we're hurting, but there's this memory somewhere in the back of our mind that's causing us to be untrustful or hateful or critical. He knows that. That desire in us to want something more or to feel like maybe we're not in the right place or to reject ourselves. He knows all of that. Because our names are written on his, on his heart. Not our names, just our names. Us, our identity is written on God's heart. We can't hide anything from him. So why do we try? Why do we act like if we don't talk to God, he's not going to know? Why do we withhold our intimacy when we're already exposed? I mean, he knows it. So why not just surrender, you know? Because he's the only one that can protect our hearts. He's the only one that can keep us. Holy, joyful, peaceful. I want to say safe. There is a certain safety spiritually in the arms of Jesus. That doesn't mean we're not going to go through stuff. But he's the only one that can redeem it. You back up a little in Hebrews, thinking about names. Hebrews 12, uh, 4 12. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrows. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And then, and before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. You know, every time I've read this, I thought it was talking about scripture because it says the word of God, right? We think of the word as scripture and there's a connection. But the word you'd hear used here is logos. Number one, which can be logic, which can be word, which can be a written word. In John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1, 1.14, it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's Jesus. This is the same word, logos. And then here's another thing. The word of God is living and active. And then a little bit longer, a little bit further. And before him, no creature is hidden. And then, all are laid bare to the eyes. Scripture doesn't have physical eyes. You know, Jesus has physical eyes. Jesus is the him. Jesus is the word that became flesh. Jesus is the one that's doing this. And finally, in Hebrews, the whole point of the first part of Hebrews is that Paul is talking about Jesus the whole time. So this comes back to Jesus, 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 Jesus. The Hebrews knew the, the scripture up until that point. They knew the Old Testament scripture. They were talking about the living, the flesh, the word that became flesh. That's what he's talking about. My name is written on God's heart. 
My identity is written on God's heart. And God's eyes see everything in me. It's a comfort. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge because who wants anybody to see your stuff, you know? Sometimes I don't like seeing my stuff. You know, when the clothes come off, you see all the jiggles. You see all the curves you don't want. You see the scratches. You see, sometimes you can see the evidence of you eating too much pie last month. Which I did. Or maybe earlier this month. Or so, you just see all these different things and the scratches and the bruises and the things that your clothes can cover to keep you safe. There's not any hiding from that. But then he knows us so well that he also knows everything we've been through. Hebrews 4.14 Since then we have such a great high priest who passed through heavens, who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Again, it's always coming back to the Word of God, the Son of God, Jesus. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. But we have one who in every respect has been tested and as we are, and yet was without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Yeah, our names are written on God's heart. Jesus knows us intimately. Jesus sees us in our nakedness. And that's not a reason to cower away in shame. If it was anybody else, maybe, short of our spouses. But according to Hebrews, that's not a reason for shame. It's not a reason for fear. It's a reason for boldness. Because when the right person sees you exposed, that's the person that can heal you. It's like when the, in the hands of most people, ripping open your body is going to kill you, you know, or at least hurt you or maim you. But in the hands of a surgeon ripping open and exposing you might be the very thing you need for healing. God knows our name. God knows everything about us. God knows what we've been through because he has been through that and worse in the Jesus person of Jesus Christ. So because of that, because we have an all-loving, all-knowing God who is intimate with us, we can approach him with our needs. Because he knows them already. He knows them better than we are. And we can ask. And you know what? We can ask and sometimes be wrong and just surrender to his will. And God is good enough that he can give us what we need, even when we're asking for the wrong things. Just the way a child may come and ask for one thing but really need another. But in point of presenting themselves to the need we see the need we as parents and as adults we're invited to take part of the healing process God wants to heal us God wants to complete us God wants to help us and even as he prepares a place for us in heaven those of us who know him he's ready to prepare our hearts even on earth for the eternal He's ready to use us in healing of others whom he loves. Nobody knows the name of those 72 people. Some people back then did. Nobody alive knows the name of those 72 people. God does. God used them. I don't care who knows your name on earth. Sure hope you have some intimate friends who know you. But God knows you. And God already knows everything about you. And God is ready to bring forth mercy and grace in your time of need. Just call on him. Just call on him. Priests used to be the people in the Old Testament who stood between the general population and God. They were sort of that rope that tried to a quick fix on that gap between the two. Jesus was the perfect cord because Jesus was human. 
is human and is God. So who better to reunite those broke, that broken piece, that broken cord, than someone who represents and is and lived as both? That's what makes him such a great priest. Because when we're connecting to that go-between, that cord, that priest, the glue, whatever you want to call it, we're connecting to God himself. What? Is there a greater reason to rejoice? Lord Jesus, thank you. You know my name. I like it when other people know my name. I like being known. I like attention, God, I admit it. Forgive me for the time where times where attention of others became more important than the attention of you. Forgive me for the times where I wouldn't have been satisfied to be called one of 72. I would want to be called by my name. But God, you know my name. You know everything about me. Lord, forgive me for the times I hide. Forgive me for the times where I try to represent something other than who I am to you, God. Because you know me and you love me and you accept me, God. And you can heal me. I pray for those out here who do not know the power of your name, God. Those who do not know you personally, just right now convict their hearts to call upon you and meet them in their time, Lord Jesus. Meet them where they're at in their need. And for those who know you but don't know your power, I, I'm sure that I don't fully know your power and we're moving towards that, Lord. Show us your power, your power, in a fresh and mighty way today, Lord, that we may praise you and call you Lord all over again. In your name, amen. Be blessed, my friends.